How's everyone doing today? Excellent. Is everyone enjoying themselves? Excellent. Cool. So, again, just wanted to uh, uh, reemphasize uh, CPE credits for today. Anyone wants CPE credits, please make sure that you have actually entered your name and your email on the sheet. There's a different sign-in sheet from yesterday. So to get your CPE credits for today, please have your email and name on that sheet. Uh, regarding the Conference Capital app, for those of you who want to link with other members or conference attendees, um, it's only for Android, but uh, download that and um, feel free to link uh, with other members. Regarding Hallway Con, um, it's, it's actually happening right now as well. It's from 1 to 3, 15 minute lightning talks with no presentation. It's actually right by the CTF room, right in the CTF room. Um, to the right of the registration table. And other than that, oh, and also wanted to mention the resume room. It's happening from 3 to 4 p.m. today in the CTF uh, room as well. So feel free to exchange business cards, exchange your resume um, as well. So it's, coming, it's going on at 3 to 4 p.m. today. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Rob Shane. Let's give a round of applause for Robert. Do you mind check good? Yes, can you hear me? All right, so I'd actually first like to, uh, for those who saw Dan Gears talk this morning, I'd like to mirror what Dan said. Uh, running a conference is really hard, so I'd like to actually acknowledge the people that put this on. So for the volunteers and, and guys that run, ran the conference, please give them all a round of applause. You don't realize it until you run one, it's really, really hard. <laughs> I just took on Source Boston this year for the first time, and it was uh, more work than I could possibly have imagined up front. So, uh, with that said, some water here. Who actually saw Dan's talk this morning? Awesome. It was good, wasn't it? So, um, Dan mentioned that we are, he believes, at an inflection point. We're, we're about to see something big happen. I also think we're at an inflection point. I'm not sure that my inflection point and Dan's inflection point are the same inflection point, but there's clearly some significant overlap. Okay? So, uh, where did those markers go? Are they so, I'm a trainer, so I like to draw. So, um, so when I got into security, I've now been, I can, God, I can almost say that I've been in IT for almost 25 years now. And I don't know if that makes me any wiser or just older, I'm not really sure. Um, so I, I got into security around 98, which was also an inflection point. How many of you were in security in 98? Anyone remember? What was it like back then? <laughs> it was better than it was in 88, right? Kind of. Denying Al Gore that he invented the internet. Denying Al Gore that he invented the internet. So what I remember from 1998 is that most things were still pretty open. Right? We were coming out of a world where we had built the internet in an academic setting where everything was meant to connect to everything. I remember in the mid-90s being able to our shell from one box to another without having to type any kind of password. It was so easy, so convenient. Right? So that was an inflection point. That was a point where we clearly needed to get better because suddenly we were noticing that people were breaking into the computers. So people were breaking into systems. So there was, a, there was a huge effort around that time period, and I remember this, um, around the idea of penetration testing systems. Breaking in, seeing where the holes were, and plugging the holes. And there was a lot of work done during that time period. And, but then we hit kind of another inflection point. This probably, you could argue when exactly this happened, but it was probably somewhere in the range of 2003 to 2005, I would say, is where that next inflection point happened. And it was the inflection point where we realized that what we had been doing was not scalable. What we had been doing at that point required the really smart people to show up and break our stuff. And there was only so many people compared to how many things needed to be broken, lots of things needed to be broken. So the next big inflection point started. And so down here, basically, in, in the first one, we ended up, you know, some people got better. Some people actually got worse. 
Because those that had already been doing the right thing suddenly said, oh, I don't have to, you know, maybe do so as much here. Um, this was, this next phase is the compliance phase. Compliance and standardization. And this was a necessary phase. It had to happen because, after, you know, at this point here, some folks were really good and, and most people sucked, frankly. Right? So we needed to find a way to get the folks that weren't doing anything up to some minimal level. And that's where things like GCI come into play, various standards and compliance regulations. Now, the problem with that is some of the folks that were down here that were doing a great job actually lowered their games. They're like, why would we do all this extra work? We don't need to do that much work to stay competitive anymore. We just need to do the bare minimum. So that kind of leads us to where we are now. Here we are today, it's 2014, and how are we doing? I don't know, we have, we, in the last, well, I actually had an interesting conversation. I was at um, the Security Things conference earlier this week, and I had a conversation with somebody about this very topic of, are we, have we gotten better, have we gotten worse, have we stayed the same? And the answer kind of is, it depends on your perspective. In some ways, we've gotten a lot better, right? The, in some ways, some of the things that you have to do in order to break into a system are a lot more sophisticated than they used to be. But in other ways, we, we in, you know, in that same way, we've bred a better bad guy. You know, the, the bad guys have had to get better in order to get into the really high-end sophisticated systems. Now, that said, there's a lot of things that just aren't very secure at all, which I'll talk about. So I think we're at this point now where we need to go somewhere from here, and we need to figure out what that looks like. I, I believe that as an opportunity, I'm an optimist, so I, I see opportunities, not just downsides. I think there's a huge opportunity here for some strategic thinking. Because at this point, everybody's got one of everything. Everybody's bought all the toys. And you know we've been saying since down here, that you know the vendors they got they have all the cool shiny boxes but that's not the solution. My apologies to any vendors in the room. But the technology is is an interesting part of the solution, but it is not the solution. And I think right now we're kind of seeing that. We everybody's got one of everything, yet we're we're seeing some of the biggest breaches ever. And all along the cost of a bug hasn't really changed. That mythical $1 bug that you find during design is still going to have a multiplier as you go into development. It's still going to be more expensive as you go into testing. And it's going to be exponentially more expensive as you, once you roll into production. This has never changed. This is the classic IBM study that shows the cost of the bug. Now, I've never seen a $1 bug. These are multipliers. And, you know, classic example, we just saw it. The target breach. 40 million credit card numbers stolen from November to December of last year. You know, hear the numbers on the total cost of that breach? It's going to be over a billion dollars. So they're getting more expensive. They're getting a lot more expensive. And, you know, this didn't really come as a surprise to anybody. What's interesting about the target breach, though, I have inter I, I've noticed that they've been getting a little bit of unfair press. It's almost like everybody's this re writing these articles is like, haha, look at those guys. See how much they screwed up? Everyone needs to take a look in the mirror, is what they need to do. What people should be doing is asking themselves, how am I similar to Target? <coughs> In what ways am I open to the exact same kinds of risks as Target? Because I can tell you for sure, I've done some security work at Target, and I've worked with some of their security teams, and at least as of a few years ago when I was there, I can assure you, they were not compliance focused, they were security focused. Their mission was, let's make it secure first and worry about compliance second, because if we, you know, security is a superset of compliance. If you're secure, you're also going to be compliant. Just because you're compliant doesn't mean you're also secure. 
right? And that was their mindset. Now, I'm not sure that mindset went all the way up the food chain, maybe, but th that was the mindset. And some of their facilities are so good that the FBI trains in them. Everybody else should be basically crapping their pants right now because everybody else is probably worse than that. Okay? So all the bad, I mean, it's, some of it's justified. Clearly they had an incident. They clearly had something get into their point of sale systems, which is an issue. But it's not because they weren't trying. And they were trying in ways that most companies would dream of being able to try. Okay? Just, just as a data set level setting kind of point of view. Now the upside of the target breach is we're probably going to get chip and pin at least six months earlier than we expected to. The ironic side of it is that wouldn't have solved the problem in the first place. <laughs> That's the funny part. So again, once again, we're, throw, we're, we're going to throw technology at this problem, but they're throwing it at the wrong problem. It's not a technology problem. Um, we saw, we had another uh, pretty amazing incident last year, the one that everybody knows about now. My mom knows about this one. The Snowden thing, the NSA. You guys all know about this, right? <laughs> so, you can, you can have different points of view on this. You can say whether it was right or wrong. Those are all interesting hallway conversations, but honestly, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. You know, in some circles of the world right now, he's the devil, in other circles he's the messiah, and you know, most people are somewhere in between. But regardless of that, what happened, happened. So what, now what? Where do we go from here? That's a much more interesting conversation to me. What do we do now? So, on the one hand, I think a lot more people are going to be using encryption. But once again, we're throwing technology at the problem. But that's going to happen. I've already seen... Here's a, here's a preview for next year's RSA conference. I guarantee you there will be a whole bunch of vendors that claim on their signage to defend against NSA-style attacks. NSA-style snooping. And I know this because I've already seen a couple vendors do it last year at RSA in February. So somebody was ahead of the curve. But that's going to be a thing. So you're gonna, I think we're, gonna, we're hitting the point finally. We're going to see a lot more end-to-end -end encryption because that, in a lot of ways, solves some of the problems. That solves the spying problem, <laughs> at least that problem. <coughs> but it still misses the point. I think the problem I'd like to see it address is this problem. <laughs> Probably, some of you guys are probably going to see me draw this picture. We have two things here, an onion and we have an egg. Now for years we've been using this as a metaphor, at least I have. And I'm not going to stop until people actually start doing it. Um, <laughs> this is the defense and death strategy. You have one layer after another, after another, after another, right? That's the classic security through layers. That model works in a lot of ways. It's not perfect. No, no security model is perfect, but it's, this is a hell of a lot better than what we typically do in most companies and organizations, which is half the end. You have this supposedly hardened outer perimeter, but once you get past, you get to the soft GUI inside. Now, honestly, we should have abandoned this model 10 years ago, but in 2014, do we really have any illusion that there's any such thing as an outer perimeter? What the hell does that even mean? <laughs> How do you even define that now? Back in the days where you had you know, a big mainframe in a room, you could define an outer perimeter and you could put an armed guard there. But nowadays, there is no perimeter. The perimeter extends at your phone. I used to say it extends at your living room, your hotel rooms, or your laptops, but it extends to your phone. The mobile devices that you're bringing to work and they're bringing home and back and forth and everywhere else, and it's, it's, this model doesn't work anymore. But I can tell you for sure, I have had a very interesting set of data points over the last 15 years in my role as a consultant and as a trainer, traveling around the world and seeing lots of different companies. And probably seen, I don't know, dozens at least, and I've 
spoken in front of 20,000 people teaching information security things, so various, various topics. And I've gotten interesting feedback from people. So I, I've seen a lot of interesting elements of different companies. And they all have the same problem. Almost every single one of them. They all have the insider security problem. And I see a lot of people nodding, so you, you guys know what I'm talking about. If you're wondering what I mean by this, every company, every organization has at least one system, and that's being generous, but at least one system on the inside that, you know, we don't have to secure that one because it's an internal system. Show of hands, who's heard that statement before? Look around the room, hold your hands up. Like almost everybody, it's like 89% of the room. So you know what I'm talking about here. What I would like to see as a, as a balancing, uh, or kind of a, a repercussion of a fallout of the Snowden thing isn't to care about, you know, are we encrypting our data from the NSA, because guess what, they're going to get it anyway. Um, but more of, you know, let's take our data and think of that as the thing that needs to be protected instead of what we've had for years is this outside in kind of model of security, right? That's how we typically design a lot of our systems. That's where the firewall comes from, right? Wouldn't it be more interesting if we started from the data itself and said, how do we protect this data wherever it moves to so it's more of an inside-out model? I think this is a mindset shift that, whose time has come and is absolutely required if we're going to make any progress from here. We can't think of it like this anymore. Every time somebody's come up with a way to protect stuff from the outside, somebody else clever either finds a way in or just becomes a trusted insider. Because I don't care what kind of external protections you had, you weren't going to defend against the Snowden attack. Because he was the ultimate insider. He had access to everything. And those systems, like most systems, were not designed in a way that would indicate that an attack was occurring. Right? You're not going to defend against everything, but you can certainly notice a lot of things. And that's, those systems weren't really set up to notice. It wasn't until he actually started making press announcements that people noticed. That's kind of funny. <laughs> All right. So, where else do we need to go from here? Clearly, we have a lot of grassroots energy in the security community. That's great. I think we should leverage that. Um, when I started working on the Source Conference in 2007, there weren't nearly as many conferences as there are today. Today, if you look at the security conference calendar, there's like one a week. You could literally have a full-time job doing nothing but going to security conferences. I think a few people in the industry have actually figured out how to manage this. They seem to be everyone that I go to and I don't go to them all. <laughs> um, but I think what's really required here is top-down leadership. You, it absolutely has to come from the top down. And I, it's interesting, when I saw the, the news last week that the Target CEO is being asked to leave in light of the incident, now it seems like there might be other mitigating fa or complicating factors as to why he had to leave, but the fact that that was even one of the bullet items was interesting. Because I think until you get a situation where the executive leadership is asked to step down if there's an incident, people aren't going to take it seriously. If that started becoming a regular thing, like every time there's a big incident, the CEO gets fired, you bet there's going to be a lot less security incidents in the next, like, we could probably solve, like, several of the top 10 OAuth issues in the next 12 months just by doing that. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Because <laughs> these guys strangle the budgets. Right? You can argue about, you know, security is a technology problem, but if you have no budget to solve it, how many of you work in an organization where your budget could be a little bit bigger than what it is? Oh, look, that's 100% of the people again. <laughs> Interesting. So you see what I'm talking about. So in my experience, security is this interesting balancing act between business and security requirements. Always. Always. The more secure you are, the less convenient it is. The more convenient you are, the less secure it is. That, that's just how it works, guys. <laughs> You all know this, I see, I see more head nodding. So, when it comes down to it, push comes to shove, which gets more weight, business requirements or security requirements? 100% of the time, correct? 
just about. Now, here's my challenge with that. I, as a, I'm as much a business consultant as I am a security consultant. I don't have a problem with that per se, except for one important detail. The executives making that decision often have no clue what they're talking about around security. And they don't go out of their way to get informed on the issues before making these decisions. That is the real crux of the problem. These folks, they, they wouldn't know a reverse shell if it bit them in the butt. <laughs> uh, they, don't, they have no idea what Metasploit is or what it does or why it's important. And from their point of view, Pony Express is some old-fashioned way of delivering the mail. <laughs> right? There's a fundamental lack of awareness in most organizations in a way that most people don't get a chance to see. Even amongst the development teams who you would think would know better on certain, some of these issues, I always do a few things when I teach classes around security. I always ask, who's heard of SQL injection? Awesome. Who's seen it? You know, and, and hands go down every time. Most people have heard of it, not as many people have seen it. Who's seen it used to get root in a box? Right? And in, in, amongst a, a developer crowd, most hands go down. Now, if somebody asked me the other day, like, why is that important? Here's why it's important. If they don't realize you can use it to go all the way to root, ever, then they don't take it seriously. Okay? Same thing, then you get into cross data scripting. Who's heard of cross data scripting? Who's heard of seeing it? Who's actually seen it used to steal a session identifier or something interesting, right? I know in this room, everybody, a lot of people have seen it. But outside of this, we're, we're in our own echo chamber here, guys. Outside of this room, people have no idea what it is we do for a living. They have no freaking clue. You know, we've had, we have the OWASP top 10. We've not even solved the top two. Because when I get to cross that request forgery, most people haven't even heard of it outside of this room. And you think, oh, but it's in the list. Yeah, tell the developer to go read the list. I dare you. <laughs> Until I show up, usually in most organizations, and physically show them the list and explain them how it works, they've never even heard of it. And this is in 2014. I had a class just a couple weeks ago. I, had, I actually was out of the training circuit for about a year, and I came back and I was like, oh, things must have gotten better. No. People are still solving 1999's problems in 2014. Now, some organizations are far further ahead of the curve. And then you get into, the, you know, everybody's talking about how DevOps is the solution, and Agile is the solution, or part of the solution. And I don't know, you know, chicken or the egg here, but they're clearly pushing each other forward, and, and both things are happening. I've seen more uptake in Agile in the last 12 months than I've seen in the last 12 years. Suddenly everybody's doing agile, like actually doing it. Like not just pretending to do it, doing like these half-assed like partial agile, partial waterfall. People are actually doing agile. For real. It's kind of interesting. Now, there's some upsides and downsides to this. The upside is you get more iterations. The downside is it's super easy with agile to go enthusiastically in the wrong direction. And it's like three or four or five sprints away before you realize, oh shit, we went the wrong way. And you gotta back it all out. And then you got to say, oh, we should have oh, gone that way. All right. And you start enthusiastically going in the right, dire wrong direction again. And you're like, oh, crap, we should have gone the other way. And we, we really needed to go this way. Right? And that actually happens. And what I've seen in some organizations recently is that when people realize here that they've suddenly started going the wrong way, and they actually say, hey, 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 we want to pause, management steamrolls. And they say, you can't pause during a sprint. So Agile is not the solution, and in a lot of ways it actually amplifies the problem. Okay? So we need to evaluate what are we doing today, and is it helping, is it not helping, what are ways we can still augment and add security into things like Agile and DevOps in ways that are actually productive and don't allow us to go too far off the beaten path before we realize we screwed up. And I think in, in a lot of cases, um, the cloud and things like Internet of Things, those just amplify this problem altogether. Because like all great new technologies, we've been running full steam ahead, putting everything we can into the cloud. And a few of us have been waving our arms saying, hey guys, slow down here, but you know, to no avail because everything is in the cloud now. 
And I think, hopefully now, that with the NSA thing, people will take a second look at, what have we really put in the cloud here? Is it actually secure? What does it mean for it to be secure? Who protects the crypto material that makes sure it's secure? I don't think we asked a lot of these questions before we put it into the cloud. Pretty sure we did not. So, in a lot of ways, in my mind, it comes down to something pretty simple. <clears throat> I think we have not one, but three separate communication gaps that occur in the industry. You definitely have a communication gap between business and technology. Right? Everybody's experienced this. The business folks speak with different vocabulary than the technical folks do. This has always been an issue. But there's also, we have two different communication gaps that we have to manage as a security industry. We have the gap between, obviously, the security and the business side, which is different, by the way. It's not the same exact gap as it between the technical and business side. Development teams have different things they have trouble communicating than security teams do. But we also have another gap to manage, which is the gap between the security and the technical side. The development teams do not understand how to read threat reports and vulnerability reports. It's Greek to them. It requires a level of translation that a lot of us seem to miss sometimes. If you want to make a good career move right now at the beginning of this third curve, become a universal translator. <coughs> we need as many universal translators as we can get because in order to get the business side to understand what really needs to be done requires us to speak in their language. Does that make sense? If you go in waving your arms about how you know, the server's going to get hacked, they're like, why do I give a shit? Is what, how they're going to look at it. Why do I care? Get out of my office. And you get, it, it's evidenced in a lot of ways by how we train the various groups. So I, I happen to have been in the security education field for a little while, and I have some interesting data points here. So the security folks live essentially in a lap of luxury here. The security folks get to go to security conferences. They probably have time allocated throughout the year to do security training classes, usually a week or two, plus in addition to the security conferences, plus the various e-learning modules they get to watch. They get all, this, all these various perks. They may not see those perks at the time. They, they really are. Now, you get over to the development teams, they might get their own set of perks around development, but when it comes to security, they're going to get the, the one to two hour awareness module that includes privacy and basic awareness, how to not you know, be in with your computer kind of thing. And they might get one to two days total in the year of security training, and they usually don't get to go to security conferences. And if they do, it's like one small local one near them, if, and that's if they're proactive enough to seek it out. Is that why you're here? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm kind of, in addition to being a geek about lots of other things, I'm a learning geek, so I like to learn how to learn, and I like to learn new things, and I like to teach people how to learn. And one of the things they always say is that if you're going to master any particular skill, you need 10,000 hours, everybody said this. Now, that might be true, but I think you can become, if you don't want to be a master, if you merely want to be an expert, 1,000 hours is plenty, if they're focused in the right way. And you can be pretty darn good at something just in 100 or 200 hours. Now, if you compare that against the you know, 8 to 16 hours these guys get per year, it's like, a, it's like pouring, you know, scooping a, um, a bucket of water out of the ocean. It's not really making a dent. It, it gives them a little bit of awareness and energy around the idea for the time, maybe a week or two after they take the class. But unless you're going to follow up with it and have it be something else as part of a broader program, it doesn't really work very well. And this is coming from somebody who sells security education for a living. Um, and then, um, interestingly enough, the folks that 
you know, we always say security is not a technology problem, it's a people problem. How much money do you think and time do you think we spend training the executives and managers? Almost zero. They get the, the, the two, one to two hour per year awareness and don't be an idiot with your computer model. That's, you, for most organizations, that's it. That's not true 100% of the places, but I would say a, a pretty broad swath of the industry across every industry falls into this. And I see more head nodding, so you guys are validating what I'm seeing here. Um, so that gives, that's kind of creates some problems. Some more water. So, one of the things I've seen in addition, I mean, because these things aren't, I'm not saying that these are broken, but they're not enough is what I'm saying. So one of the things that I've seen that works really well, a lot of leading organizations are doing things like creating programs for what they call security deputies or security champions or local security coordinators or security ninjas. Now here's a little pop quiz for you. Of the things I just said, Security champions, security ninjas, um, what was the other one I said? Local security coordinators. Which one do you think appeals to the business side the most? Ninja. Not ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> these guys love being ninjas. These guys love be these guys really love being ninjas. Right? These guys have they're like, what the hell are the ninjas? <laughs> right? So you have to speak their language. They like the security champions. Because very kumbaya kind of feeling, we are the champion. Um, that, you, you have to think and speak in their terms if you want them to come along. These guys have better things to do than be security ninjas. They don't care. In fact, that actually is the antithesis of what they want to be. They don't want to be security experts. They see it as, why is the security thing getting in the way of my job? Right? How am I doing on time? I just wanted to know where I fall. Um, so those kinds of programs, I think, work really well. And I think they can be an extension of what we already have here. I think that, again, as an industry, we have a lot of really good community activities that happen now that didn't used to happen 10 years ago. I remember when I first started learning about security, I went to the bookstore. There was like the three books. And I mean that literally, the three books. And now there's like hundreds of books, there's lots of resources, there's all these community activities where you can go and learn from people. But it can't just stop, that, that's great for this part. But we need to find ways to, so how many of you guys would consider yourself social engineers? Or at least admire social engineers in some way, right? So you can use, use your social engineering lessons to get this information over to these other groups. Run about a, a brown bag lunch, invite people to show up. You want a good way to get security deputies, security ninjas, security champions, whatever you want to call it? Host a brown bag lunch on an interesting security topic and see who shows up. Those are your first recruits. Some of you have heard me say this before. That's, I've been advocating for this for a while now. You need to find a way to get them more involved. That's, that has to be the answer. Because if, if these guys don't get it, then you're going to continue to run on shoestring budgets. You're going to continue to get the rug pulled out for you at the last minute when you otherwise wouldn't need to. And when we get together, we really can do cool things. Heartbleed is a good example. Heartbleed came out as one of the most serious security issues that's come out in years. And within a few days, not only was it you know, on its way to being fixed, but everybody knew about it. Even the people outside of our sphere knew about it. I went and did a training class at a group of non-security people two weeks after Heartbleed, and every single person in the room knew about it, and still most of them didn't know what Crossfit Request for Agree was. So we did something right. We managed to get to, to get the noise up for that and get, go past the drowning out, but that was because it was a really serious issue. <coughs> if we were to take like one issue per year in the OS top 10 and just make it, all right, this is the year of SQL injection. 2015, we're gonna eradicate SQL injection forever, and as an industry, if we just decided to make that happen, we could probably do it. It would require a lot more work than what we 
you probably think it's going to require it, though. Because it's not a security issue. You've got to convince these guys that they need to spend money on it. That's the trick. Now, how do you do that? You have to speak their language. So, I have a few closing remarks. Does anybody have any questions while I'm getting into cold water? What is their language with respect to say, a SQL injection? How do they, how do they, why do they care? Has anybody successfully sold defending SQL injection? Wants to answer that? After or before we got hacked? <laughs> <laughs> before. All right, so but what, what, what's your before and after? Uh, I was running a social media startup, you know, hacking together a bunch of PHP code. We were using, um, uh, it wasn't Drupal, it was one of the you know, frameworks, and you know, it was all handled with SQL. But you know, I saw the problem, and I said, hey, you know, this is kind of an issue when we're getting more popular. And then some guy from Russia ran a bunch of tools on it, probably SQL or something, and we got hacked, and we got the entire database done. There was no credit card information in there, but we lost people's phone numbers and uh, email addresses and suck. And then suddenly, hey, guess what? We should work on security now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nothing like a breach to get people's attention. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah I, wrote, I wrote an article a couple of years ago talking about development and why we haven't seen security development really take off. Despite the fact that it's a decade long, it's because we don't reward it. Part of, the, part of the issue isn't just you know speaking the same language, because a lot of times, Security people were technical people, so they can't speak a lot of the same language, but rewarding it. I've never seen a developer rewarded for being secure. They get rewarded for being performance. Right. Yep. I, I've seen it occasionally, but very rarely. And, and it does work well when, when they do find ways to do it, but you have to make it a priority enough that you're going to grade people on are you secure or not. Now, one thing to answer your point, uh, your question is, um, I have found that an appropriately placed demo, you know, if a picture speaks a thousand words, a good demo speaks 10,000, but it better be a good demo. So if it's a demo where you show up and you start getting down into the weeds of all the technical reasons why this is an issue and all, and you put them to sleep, then you've missed the point, you missed your opportunity. But if you can get in quick and be like, look, here's SQL injection, it's because of injection flaws. Injection flaws occur in the following 27 different languages. SQL injection is only one. And then you go and say, all right, well, here's this example of an application that's using SQL. Let's type some things into it. You show them single quarter one equals one and show them how to bypass authentication. And then you're like, all right, but then it gets worse. And then actually show them how to execute commands and things. And within about 10 minutes, you, you get their attention. But most people, when they do demos, I've noticed, they want to show everything. They want to show all the details and all, and you've got to cherry pick what you show them. And you've got to get to the point. So whenever I give, just here's a little tip for you guys. Anytime I give a presentation of any kind or a demo of any kind, always ask yourself the following question. What do you want them to think, do, or feel at the end of your talk or your demo? If you cannot answer that question in like five words, you're probably going to fail. Yeah? You talked before about uh, translating uh, business language to executives and, and talking about things that way. Uh, do you often, uh, when you're trying to sell security, represent it as a, an ROI um, to make that impact? Sure. Um, so here, that actually kind of, I didn't pay you for this, I swear. Uh, <laughs> so again, we live on Moore's Law. And according, as, as Dan mentioned, there's, there's multiple different versions of Moore's Law. But let's just keep it as one exponential curve. So as technology increases, we have the opportunity to build more cool toys, right? Um, the fact that I have an iPhone in my pocket, that, could, that wasn't even possible 15 years ago, right? That's because of Moore's Law that I get that cool toy. Um, a few years ago, um, suddenly we started seeing cloud-based file storage, things like Dropbox and Box.com and various other iterations of that. That, up until we reached a certain point where we had enough bandwidth to pull that off, that wasn't possible. So that also was a follow up. Now, every time we do this, we create new security issues. Now, I am going somewhere with this, I promise. Um, I believe that the hacking community tends to follow this curve fairly closely because as an individual or a small organization, it's not very hard to. 
You just buy the latest toys and you can see what they do, and you, you keep up with the latest things on GitHub and you know or wherever you get your code from, and you can, you can pretty easily keep up. Most organizations do they follow Moore's law at the exponential speed? Not even close, right? It's much more of a linear deployment. Every once in a while, there's a little bit jump up, but it's still basically linear. So what that means by definition, if you buy into that premise, is that the gap, if this is time, and we were to put, say, you know, 2000 here, and 2015 here, which for any given 15 year period, this curve probably applies, the gap is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And to Dan's point this morning, I think we're almost at a point where if we don't do something now, it's too late. Yeah. So how about in terms of geek speed, jail? So the SEC has enforced you know, new regulations, and also part of So in terms of SEC speak and geek speak, uh, how about jail time? So again, seriously, uh, the SEC has said, you know, you are liable. You, for negligence, you can go to jail. You have to document what your IP costs are for your loss. It's easier for a software company, particularly if they're selling software. It started with Symantec. So today, it's really with any public company, if you're a public entity. You can come in on training for that too, right? at a management level and for technology and development. Who's that? Oh, getting a steal on the mic? Is that, is that wise? Brief. <laughs> Is that wise? Um, so you were talking about the big challenge that there is to communicate to the business and so on, and uh, I was reminded of two things. One of them is, uh, Hartley, there was that XKCD comic about a, yeah. a couple of weeks ago <laughs> that I thought um, did a very good job of explaining in barely non-technical terms uh, what the technical aspect of it was, and also, though, emphasizing what the end impact was. And then I was reminded also, Rob, by a demo that I did like 10 years ago. There was a non-technically focused, but a live demo not to the board, but to the spouses of the board members, non-technical people. And it was a direct, I used a zero day or near zero day direct reversal vulnerability to show deletion of all the pictures in your folder and showing it live. It didn't have to show a lot of the technical explanations of what was going on because they don't understand and they don't care. The emphasis was much more on the impact and we did it, and we did it live. And that was, you could hear the breath go out of the room. Yep. So just to reinforce, I think the notion of demos that emphasize the, the impact was really useful. I, I have not found anything more impactful than demos. Even for, like, even for the business crowd, if you, if you adjust the level to where you're not talking in such a technical depth that they can't understand you, if you adjust the demo, you can show cross that request, request for you to a, to a CEO. It's totally possible. Uh, if you can't do it, it's because you haven't figured out how to do it. It's totally possible. SQL injection is possible. Process scripting is possible. I can't do that. What does that say? Ten. Okay. <laughs> My eyes aren't that good. Yeah. So, at what point does it become fun? It's, that's a good what point. Does what point does it become, become fun? So, it becomes fun when you're lying. Right? It becomes fun when you're, when you're basically making claims about things that aren't really true. But if you can take an off-the-shelf piece of software, even if it's a little bit old, and demonstrate how you could use potentially to go all the way to root on for a particular issue, that's not fun. It's real. It's using actual software, actual vulnerabilities. Um, you know, if you kind of do that, the, the arm waving dance while you're doing it, I don't know, maybe then you cross the line. I don't know. There, there, there is a there is a, a fine line you have to kind of walk because you don't want to just be the guy that's going around saying the sky is falling all the time. But if you look across, um, you know, the CWE list, CVE list, like in a lot of ways, the sky kind of is falling, <laughs> or it has fallen many, many, many times. So educating people on the ways that the sky has fallen over time, I don't see that as fun. I think that's just education, because um, honestly, most people think it's a lot better than it really is. Most people have no clue. When once you really start to get down into things like, what's a rootkit? How does a rootkit work? What does it do to your system? What are the various layers of rootkits you can have in your system? And once you, once people you, you have no clue that stuff even exists, that's not fun. It's just that it's just informing. Uh, do you think we, as security professionals, 
Do you think we as security professionals do a good job articulating the risk? Because risk is a common concept that's understood by everyone, and maybe that's the key to uh, communicate to business? Sure. You're actually, again, you're setting me up for my final point. Um, so I think that the language of business is finance, accounting, and risk. That's it. If you want to, if you want to learn how to speak to a, an executive, those are the words they typically speak in, finance, accounting, and risk. It's, it's usually in some way, it boils down on some level to the numbers. And the risk of those numbers going one way or the other. Now I'm simplifying a little bit, but that's, it, those are clearly key points. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, and what's interesting about that is so you have on the business side, you have, you have, you have basically finance, accounting, risk. On the security side, we also have risk. But it's not just business risk that we worry about as security people. We also have technical risk. They're not the same thing necessarily. Just because something can be broken into and should be patched or could be patched doesn't mean that as a business it makes sense to in every case. Right? They're not the same thing. So we need to learn how to shift our language from here into the business side and understand how what we're talking about affects the business, because that's what the executives care about. How does this affect my business? What is the risk of not doing something versus not doing something here? Right? But in a lot of cases, they're making those decisions from an uninformed point of view. That's my point. Way in the back of that question. Right, so speaking of specifically SQL injection, as someone who's been programming SQL for a very long time, uh, I want to share with a bit of a smile a 100% solution to uh, <laughs> never having to deal with SQL injection. If you use a NoSQL database, you will not be compromised by SQL injection. Now, that doesn't mean you won't be compromised in some other way, but on a serious note, uh, things like SQL injection can be, in some cases, eliminated at the design stage. For example, if you're worrying about you, your website being compromised by injection in a programming language, you could conceivably compile the code rather than use a programming language that's interpreted. And even if you use a SQL database, uh, once you're at a scale of tens of thousands of machines, they usually don't scale up that far, so you end up writing an API layer between your SQL database and the rest of your website anyway, might as well make that API layer deal with things like SQL injection. Right, so there's, there's all, for any given issue, there's, there's always an answer, right? That's a, good, that's a good set of answers. That's a good set of possible answers. Um, that may not work in every environment, but it's a good possible set of answers. But for any given issue, there's a set of answers. It's not that we don't know the answers. Right? It's convincing the development teams and the business teams that the answers are the right thing to do. So we need to work a little bit more closely with them. I think in a lot of ways, security needs to be something as part of what we do as a business rather than just you know, something we do as an industry. Yeah. It is not solved just because it's called cross-site request forgery. Heartbleed had a cool name and a logo, and I think that's I think that's a big driver for why it was so successful in, in yep. getting penetration and, and the C-level executives. I mean, how many people, even C-level folks I know, talk to? Uh, they know about CryptoLocker now. CryptoLocker sounds kind of cool. SQL injection doesn't sound that cool, and CryptoLocker is easy to explain. SQL injection not so much. But I mean, how many people remember I Love You and Melissa and you know? So it, it, it seems almost like a, it's. We need to, to focus more on marketing sometimes and so have a cool name. Marketing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like marketing can can maybe win the day for us, and not so much focusing on the technical. Yep. All right. Another question. Back. Yeah. Uh, so how do you suggest implementing security as part of the business process? Where do I even start? <laughs> Give me. A, ask me a more specific question. Um, I've noticed that a lot. Of, well, the issue is most. Most executives don't even think about security as part of their business or business process. And 
I think sometimes the security guys don't actually get involved with how the business process works. And so therefore they are on a knowledge of how a department works and how the security affects. And, so, and then I think how does a security person say, hey, this is insecure and how you're doing things to make it secure? Right, so I can tell you, um, I have a couple data points that I think help. Um, one is that when security is part of the IT organization, it's not going to get the right level of visibility. The, the projects I've had the most impact on are ones where I've been able to go in and have carte blanche to just ask whoever I want to, so what do you do for a living? What is your, what is your piece of the pie? How does it work? How does it fit into the bigger picture here? Um, and being able to address that all the way up and down the stack is kind of what's necessary. So I think we need to see more, I was actually talking to just the other day about this, we need to see more C-level positions at the security level. Right? It's, it shouldn't just be an adjunct of the CIO's team. There, it should be at the same level as everybody else. The, the, the joke the other day was that you know, security should get a seat at the big kids table. And oftentimes it does not. So that, again, that requires top-down leadership and requires us to find ways to teach the executives that it needs to be at that level. Now, this is a process. This isn't going to just magically snap your fingers. It's going to require a lot of our social engineering skills to make this happen over time. We have one, one last question over here. All right. One possible way you could uh, address this if you ask a business stakeholder, what are the three absolute worst things that could happen to this business? Yep. And if any one of them have a root in addressing it securely. It's their words. Yep. You, you told me that these three things keep you up at night, so mm -hmm. let's talk about how we make them. Right. So here's a, so that's the, I'm going to riff off that for a second, because I've actually, I have a good technique that works for this. So, you guys familiar with this acronym? <laughs> yeah. not, not the organization, but confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So here's something I've done in my architecture classes a lot. I go in and I'll say, all right, Confidentiality, integrity, availability, choose one. Which one's the most important? Which one's the most devastating if it fails? And a lot of folks don't know how to answer this because they're like, well, they're all important. I'm like, pick the one that's the most. And then I walk into an exercise and say, for confidentiality, if suddenly all your confidential data suddenly ended up on the internet, how screwed would you be? And they're like, oh, pretty screwed. I'm like, good. So now, we're, now we have something we can measure, the level of screwed, right? So then I say, all right, integrity. If suddenly all of your data integrity fail, everybody can change everything all the time. What does that look like for you? And then finally, if suddenly everything is shut off and it's off for a week, what does that look like for you? And for most people, most organizations, all three, they'd be pretty screwed. But usually, just through having that conversation, it, it is a kind of a lighthearted way of getting them to figure out which one really matters to them the most, and for each one, why it matters. And that, that actually is a really good way of convincing the upper management. I've actually used that technique a lot, so thanks for giving me that alley up there. All right, so I think I'm just about out of time. Let's see if anybody has a really burning question they have to get out. One more quick one? All right, this will be the last one, and then, I, then I'll wrap up. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, when you talked about the three humps yep. that you're facing, you said that the last hump is going to go uh, into strategic thinking. So, I don't think it necessarily has to go there. I think it should go there. So how would you tie the last knot back to your strategic thinking? And um, All I'm hearing so far is the strategic thinking for the security industry is to become good communicators and raising an awareness with executives. Yeah. So what else, how do you tie the knot back to your strategic thinking? What's the next step in that? So um, is it, that's, a, that's a pretty loaded question. All right. So. That's why it's the last one. That's why it's the last one. Right. Yes, That's for burning one. That's for burning one. Let me let me think about that for a second before I just start spewing out everything. Um, so I do believe in a lot of ways, because I've been fighting this battle for 15 years now, I really do believe it the key element of it is communication. But what are we communicating? That's an important element of what are we communicating. I think communicating the idea of defense in depth is important. I think that's a key one. Um, the, the moment of Zen I'm going to leave you with at the end here, uh, you know, Dan Gear mentioned that everything must die and things need an expiration date. And I actually, uh, I'm not supposed to say this, but I heard him give this, a similar talk the other day. And uh, so I heard that quote twice. 
and both times it kind of struck me as fairly profound, like <laughs> the point of living is to die. <coughs> but, you know, if you follow any kind of Eastern philosophy, everything has got, you know, a little bit of a duality to it. So if the point of life is to die, well, the point of life is also to live. And I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. Um, <laughs> I, I have a lot of um, bonsai trees and things at home, and I, I've seen them. Like, some of them, you can even cut off a leaf, and they'll grow just from the leaf. They really want to live. And the security industry, in a lot of ways, I remember a time when there wasn't a security industry. And what I've observed, like all good industries, is that it's followed the same patterns as every other industry, which is it needs, it needs to grow in order to survive. It need, in order to grow, it needs more money. In order to get more money, has, we have to sell more products. And in order to sell more products, we have to engage in more fun and a bunch of other crap that we all find distasteful. So I think that the answer we're going to find here isn't going to come from the industry per se, even though we're all a part of it. It's going to come from the, the places where I've seen where they make the most impact the fastest, where they're the furthest along the curve. Uh, I would say are the ones where you have, uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll call out somebody specific, somebody like a Bob Brutus at Liberty Mutual, who is really making sure and driving home that security must happen here, it must happen now, it's very important. So you kind of need that champion to step up and do it. Uh, another good example is, is Akamai. You get Andy Ellis up there you know, doing the same things. And unfortunately, those. We should look at those as examples of what to do and what to follow, because there's this path has been tread before. And so in a lot of ways, it's kind of lather, rinse, repeat, and follow what has been done that what you've seen that has worked. But every organization is a little bit different, so there's really no one-size-fits-all answer as much as the vendors would like there to be, because that's where they can sell you the shiny box. I really believe that the answer is a people problem, and it really does require looking at every organization that we're, that we're talking about and try to understand what are the actual problems that we have here. What are the assets that we're trying to protect? What are the risks to those assets? And based on that, you come up with a plan for how do we communicate to everybody what needs to be done. Because it's going it's, it's to vary from place to place. That was kind of my long-winded crazy answer to your question, I hope. If it didn't answer your question, come ask me afterwards. But my time is up, so thank you all. Well, so it's possible next year. <laughs>